Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning worship services of the Holgate Street Church of Christ. It is so good to have you. We invite you to join along as we worship God this morning. The call to worship this morning comes from Psalms 96, and I'll begin in verse 1. O sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Father, we're just so thankful to be in your presence once again. Father, we're so thankful for the way that you have blessed us, for the way that you have looked over us and cared for us. Father, we want to praise you this morning, and we ask your blessing upon us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Yes, I'm learning, learning to lead. Yes, I'm learning to lead. Yes, I'm learning to lead. Every day I'm finding more power than I ever Yes, I'm learning, learning to lean on Jesus. Yes, I'm learning, learning to lean. At an altar, at an altar I knelt, I found peace, so serene, and all oh, oh, that he asks us is a child, a child like trust, and a heart. Oh, that's pure. Oh, that's pure. Pure. Pure and clean. Yes, I need to be every day. I sickness when I'm alone and in despair I call on Jesus and he's always there oh, yes, he is. you know he'll, he'll never leave me never he leave won't me. forsake me he'll be there he'll be there he'll be there Anytime, oh, anywhere, yes, I'm learning, learning to, to lean, learning to lean, oh, you know learning, I'm learning to lean, learning to lean on Jesus. Oh, Yes, 
I'm learning. Learning to lean. Every day I'm learning. Learning, learning to, to lean on. on Jesus. Oh, you know, you know, you know I'm finding more. I'm learning, learning to lean on, lean on Jesus. All right, you worshipers. It's time to forget about all the trouble the devil's brought in our life. Give it over to God. Yeah. I want you to know right now it's his time. To the everlasting we gotta give him praise. Let everybody worship Come on. the Lord. Oh, let's worship him. Oh, come on, saints, he's worthy. Right. Yeah. Worship the cake from your mind. Everything. Oh, worship the cake from your mind. Everything. That your troubles may be worthy of the glory, giving the praise, yeah. Oh, together we can, yes, we can. Oh, worship the Lord. I don't know about you, but it has shown up here to me. So when your troubles come, just hold the God's unchanging Listen, you might have brought some trials. You might have brought some tribulations here this morning. You might be feeling a little weary, but I came to tell you, Jesus, yes, He does. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Then we can truly, we can truly worship the Lord. Oh, yes, we can. The Lord. Oh, yeah. the Lord. oh, I still believe there's somebody here that needs Jesus. He's waiting on you with his hands outstretched. Come on, Tom, this morning. Oh, it's time to worship. Come on, let's worship him. It's okay. Oh, praise God for your sister. Praise God for your brother. That's it. We now have the opportunity to commune around the Lord's table and remember the gift of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I would like to read from John, the third chapter, beginning in the 16th verse, and it reads, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the love that you have for us, for the gifts that you've given us. We're so thankful for the gift of Christ. We're so thankful for his sacrifice. Father, for all that he did that we might be saved. Father, we thank you for this bread that reminds us of his body as it hung on the cross for us. Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine because it reminds us of the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, as we partake of this emblem, we ask that you would help us to remember Jesus and all that he went through for our sake. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. I know it was the blood. I know it, I know it was. was. I know. I know.
another part of our worship is giving back to God what, from what he has so richly blessed us with. I would like to read a few verses from 2 Corinthians 9, chapter beginning in the 6th verse. And it reads, But I say this, he who spo- sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings that you've given to us, have entrusted us with. Father, we want to be the kind of givers that you would have us to be. We want to be cheerful givers. Father, we ask that you bless us and that you would help us as we work on our giving. Father, we ask that you bless the offering this morning, that you would bless our use of it. Father, we thank you so much for all that you have done for us, and we want to be the kind of giver that you are. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. There are three ways that you can give this morning. The first way is through our website. You can go to wholegatecfc.com, hit the Donate tab, and enter your information there. The second way is through the Zelle app, where you can go to treasurer at wholegatecfc.com, and you can make your offering there. The third way is the P.O. box, where you can mail your check to Holgate Street Church of Christ, Box 18226, Seattle, Washington, 98118. Thank you, and may God continue to bless you. When I'm there with you in heaven, what a wondrous joy will be gathered with the angel. By the glassy sea Such a thought is hard to fathom In the presence of my King And with countless ones forgiven Gathered round the throne to sing Glory and awesome thing cause you are God and to your glory we will worship and abide in your presence there forever we'll be happy to reside glory and honor worthy is the land
Good morning and thank you for joining us today. I appreciate you for uh, tuning in every Lord's Day and uh, especially appreciate those of you that are uh, sharing this broadcast with others. We want to uh, continue to broaden our reach and uh, so uh, make sure you share uh, this opportunity with others. Uh, this morning we're going to continue our study in our series on faith, hope, and love. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13 the Apostle Paul says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. What we've been uh, suggesting is that uh, these are uh, uh, the core qualities of the Christian's life, and uh, we need to be growing in each of these. And so we've suggested that when it comes to our faith, meaning uh, the, the confidence and assurance and trust and belief that we have in God, that that, that faith needs to continue to be strengthening. So we want to we be in the constant process of strengthening our faith. And then when it comes to our hope, uh, which we define as a positive expectation of the future uh, that's based on and rooted in the character and the promises of God, that hope, we want, we've said that we want that hope to uh, continue to, to be being renewed, so renewing our hope. And that's necessary because hope diminishes. Uh, hope tends to fade over time. So, so we need to develop uh, the kind of character uh, so that our hope can constantly be renewed. Now, when it comes to this third aspect, the aspect of love, uh, I've mentioned uh, the term deepening. We need to deepen our love. Now, I want to I edit that uh, um, because of uh, a text that we've been reading. And so instead of edit, uh, deepening our love, which we ought to do, I want to begin using the term perfecting our love, perfecting our love. And uh, that's based on uh, what we've been reading in uh, the letter of 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. And uh, that verse says that no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us or his love is perfected in us. Uh, now, uh, this, this expression, um, I think, primarily is, is talking about uh, God's love that that is being perfected in us. In other words, there's, there's nothing else that God can do to demonstrate his total love for us. He's, he's done everything, so it's complete. There's nothing lacking in it. But the concept here is that the love that God has for us is the same love that we should be expressing to others. Now that love is, is incomplete. That love is continuing to grow. It's continuing to develop. So in that sense, uh, our love must be uh, continuously in the process of being perfected. Now, we have everything that we have, we're equipped, but it's the exercise of that love. So, so I want to talk uh, from this point then about strengthening our faith, renewing our hope, and perfecting our love. So, so I want to add that as we're studying uh, this concept. Now, uh, there's three uh, expressions of love, and again, it's reflected in this passage in uh, 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 12, and that is, first of all, our love for God. Uh, secondly, it's, uh, or, or rather, God's love for us, primarily God's love for us, our love for God in response, and then our love for one another. So the question is, uh, what is love? That's, that's really the quest that we're on. We're, we're, we're in this search to, to try to better understand this idea uh, of love, and how do, we, how do we love, and how do we grow in terms of our capacity and ability to love. Well, years ago, a group of researchers um, posed this question, what is love, to uh, a group of four to eight-year-olds, and I want to share a couple of those responses, and they simply ask, uh, to you, what does love mean? Well, Rebecca, who is age eight, she said, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it all the time, even when his uh, hands got arthritis too. She says, well, that's love. Carl, who was age five, said this, love is uh, when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. That was good. <laughs> and then uh, Chrissy, who was age six, said, love is when you go out to eat and you give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. I like that. 
And then uh, Danny, age seven, uh, said, love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and then she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure it tastes okay. And then finally, uh, I like this one, Marianne, who's age four. Marianne says, love is when your puppy licks your face even after you've left him alone all day. So, so those are uh, some answers about what is love. Uh, so we're exploring this, this idea. What is love? What is it really? Now, <clears throat> if, our, if our love for others is going to be more complete, we've got to understand it. So uh, to help us to do that today, I want to talk about um, this idea of four loves. Four loves. Now, if you've been around for a while, been in the church, uh, you've heard about these four loves. And... Um, what I want to challenge you to do is to, is to deepen your understanding of those. You're aware, you can have this surface awareness, but I want to challenge you to understand your, uh, this, uh, these concepts uh, in, a, in a deeper way, in a more insightful way. And um, uh, if you've not heard of these before, I think you're going to be uh, excited uh, about what I have to share for you and with you. So let's begin. I want to begin by reminding us that the Bible was not originally written in English. Uh, the Old Testament was written primarily uh, in the Hebrew language, uh, some Chaldean, and uh, the uh, New Testament was written primarily in the Greek language. Uh, there's some Aramaic in there as well. So the original texts of the Bible primarily were written in Hebrew and Greek. And in the Greek language, um, uh, we find that, that Greek... Is, is a much more colorful language as compared to English. It's more, much more detailed. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of like comparing um, black and white television with color TV. And for those of you that are, that are younger, yeah, there, there was such a thing as black and white TV. If you look at old movies or old shows, old programs, they were all filmed in black and white. Uh, color television did not become uh, available on the market until 1954. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, um, I remember seeing my first color television. Uh, it was um, owned by a woman by the name of Mrs. Jones. She lived in, this is when we lived in Lewisburg, Tennessee. Uh, my father worked for her for years and, and she, you know, she had a business. Uh, she was pretty well off financially and so she had a color TV. And so we'd go over on Sundays and, and watch Bonanza in color. And, and it was so exciting to watch a TV program in color. So Greek is, is, is like that. It's much more colorful than English. It's much more detailed. Now, when it comes to this idea of love, we find that uh, in the Greek language, there are four uh, different terms that are translated love in our English language. And... Um, in comparison, uh, in English, we, we will use the word love even though it has different meanings. So, for example, we can say, uh, I love pizza, or I love my wife, or I love my mother, uh, I love my job, I love the beach. So, so all of these are expressing a relationship about someone or something, and, and we use the term love. Well, uh, in the Greek language, there are different words that specify the kind of love that you're talking about. So let's look at these. Let's look at these four different loves. Uh, the first type of love in the Greek language is, is the term, it's the word eros, eros. Eros, very simply, is sensual love. Uh, it's, it's the feeling love. It's, it's based on uh, the emotions that you have toward a person. Uh, it... Uh, in particular, it has to do with, with feelings toward the opposite sex, the word eros. It's, from, um, uh, it's the word from which we get our English word erotic, eros, erotic. It involves romantic love. It's sexual. Uh, it's based on attraction, physical attraction. You express eros toward those uh, to whom you are physically attracted uh, when you see someone, uh, you get butterflies uh, in your stomach, you, you perspire, your heart beats faster. Uh, this is eros. Uh, I remember uh, when I when we came to Seattle, I was in the third grade, and there was a girl, I was in third grade, was a, there was a girl that uh, I felt this way about her. And so uh, when she would walk past my, my chair, the back of my chair, I'd scoot my chair back to her so that we could, we could touch. Okay, that's, that's eros. 
Uh, this is the kind of love that's between a boyfriend and a girlfriend. This is the kind of love between husbands and wives. Uh, when someone says uh, that I'm, I've fallen in love, that's, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about I have this physical attraction toward this person, uh, it, and it's almost like it's, overcome, you know, it's overcoming me. I, I can't help it. Uh, when a person says, I don't love him anymore, for the most part, that, that's, that has a lot to do with what that means. I'm not attracted to that person. I don't want to be around that person anymore. Now, when um, we talk about this kind of love, what we observe is that um, this, this love is, is expressed in movies. Uh, you find that, that love is a, uh, it, it's always a theme. You know, 99% of the time, it's always a theme in a movie or story. We find it's the most popular theme of songs. And when you, when you think about lyrics of songs, uh, love and this kind of love is, is the theme. Uh, I want you to think back in your own life about popular songs and, and love songs. I remember um, uh, 1963, uh, uh, the Beatles released uh, She Loves You, Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. That was, that was 1963. I remember... Um, uh, years ago, too, uh, a song that, according to uh, the Billboard uh, Top 100, is, was the most popular song, love song, you know, over the last seven decades. Uh, it was um, uh, Endless Love, written by Lionel Richie and sung by Richie and Diana Ross, 1981. Um, one that sticks in my mind uh, was a song by Al Green. Okay, Al Green, let's, let's stay together. I, I'm so in love with you. Whatever you want to do is all right with me. Okay, everybody can sing that, right? So, so you, can, you can remember these songs. They're all about love, but, it's, but we're talking about primarily uh, this erotic love. That's, that's really what it's about. Now... Um, this, um, this concept of erotic love is mentioned in the Bible. And uh, let me just give you one Old Testament reference and a New Testament reference. In the Old Testament, uh, if you were to read the book of the Song of Songs, Song of Songs, this is a, a book written by Solomon. And uh, it, it really is a, it's a picture of the love of God for his people, but it, it's expressed in terms of human love. Uh, let me read you a couple of verses. This is from the Song of Psalms, uh, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Here it says, and this is the woman uh, talking to uh, and about the king. She says, Oh, that he would kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. The fragrance of your perfume is intoxicating. Your name is perfume poured out. No wonder young women adore you. Take me with you. Let us hurry. Uh, oh, that the king would bring me into his chambers. So this, this is an expression of this uh, kind of romantic, uh, erotic love. In the book of Hebrews, um, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, the Bible says, Let the marriage, or let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulteress. And so the marriage bed is speaking of the sexual relationship between a husband and wife. And so uh, this kind of romantic love uh, is eros. And again, according to God's plan, uh, it was designed only to be experienced between a husband and a wife. So here we have this first, uh, this first word, uh, uh, this Greek term that relates to uh, sensual love, romantic love. It's the term eros. Uh, the second word uh, is the term phileo or philia or, or any, of its, um, uh, any of its forms. And primarily phileo has to do with love between friends. It's love between friends. We have uh, there's a term, uh, uh, Philadelphia, which again was one of the churches, seven churches of Asia. We have uh, the, uh, the city in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. It's a city of brotherly love. That's, that's the idea here. So phileo, love between friends. Uh, what this means is that you know each other, uh, you like each other, you, being, you enjoy being together, and, and there's a give and take in this type of love. 
Uh, even the term is used you know, with Facebook. Those of you that use Facebook, what do you call the people to whom you're related on Facebook? You call them your friends. They're your friends. It's that kind of relationship. There's fondness. Uh, there's enjoyment. Uh, you have shared interests, uh, shared tastes, shared preferences. Now, this, uh, this term was used uh, in the Gospel of John uh, referring to Jesus' relationship with Lazarus. Uh, of course, uh, Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. Uh, and here's what it says. It says, uh, John 11, verse 1, Now a man named Lazarus uh, was sick. Uh, and, and of course, Jesus goes to heal him, but in the introduction... Uh, they introduced him as Lazarus. He was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. And verse 3 says that his sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. The one you love is sick. Now, this word love uh, is translated from the root of phileo. So here we see uh, the second kind of love, um, phileo, it's, it's friendship love. So eros is sensual love, uh, uh, phileo is friendship love, and a third term that was used in the Greek language uh, is the term storge, storge. Now storge refers uh, very simply, can be seen as family love, love among family members, uh, brothers and sisters, parents and children, uh, extending to aunts and uncles and so forth. Uh, and it has to do with the natural affection you have toward one uh, to whom you relate it. Uh, this past week, uh, uh, Jack and I attended uh, the funeral services for uh, B. Butler's mother who passed away. And uh, there were others who attended, Tony, Cynthia, uh, Hazel, and uh, Alice. And we thank them for, for uh, taking the time to do that. But, but in this service, uh, during the time where family members were given the opportunity to express various remarks... You, you could hear the words and, and, and you, could, uh, you could see the, the expressions and, and, and you, you got this feeling that these guys really loved each other, okay? And, and uh, I don't know, maybe there were 50 or so relatives there, uh, but, but you, you, you just sense this connection between them and this care that they had for each other. That's storge, it's, it's family love. Now, the word itself appears twice uh, in the negative. It has an A in between, which means without. So the term uh, ars, uh, uh, astargos, astargos with an A, it really means without love. That, that term appears devoid of affection. Uh, let, me, uh, let me give you the two references. The first is in Romans chapter 1 and verse 31, which, in which uh, the Apostle Paul describes... Uh, the qualities of people who have rejected God. And, and what he says, this is Romans 1, uh, verse, beginning at verse number 28. He says, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they uh, do what ought not to be done. All right, so here you have people who did not acknowledge God. So, so God said, okay, if you don't want to acknowledge me, I'm just going to let, let you go. Here's how he described the, the qualities of those individuals. He says, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. He says, they're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. Now, when you, when you, um, um, you, you watch the news or, or read about the news, and things that, that happen, you know, every, it seems like every day there's somebody that's killed that's shot in Chicago. And you kind of wonder, why is that? Well, I think the underlying cause is that people have rejected God. When you reject God, uh, uh, all kinds of evil and wrongdoing will be displayed in your life. He continues, verse 30. He says they are, uh, at the end of verse 29, they're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. Uh, they disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity. And then it says they have no love, and he follows that with no mercy. Uh, so this expression uh, of no love is this term, uh, astorgos. Astorgos, which means they have no love. King James translate it, translates it uh, without affection. And I think what this, what this suggests is that 
uh, these are individuals who, who don't even uh, have a sense of, of love for their own family members. And when you read about crimes uh, uh, that occur, uh, we, we read about crimes that family members are perpetrating upon one another. The second, the second uh, place that this appears is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. It's the same idea. Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. And again, as we look at our world and what's going on in our world, we see the terrible times. We're witnessing, we're living in these terrible times. Again, a, a clue that you know, we're in the last days. He says, People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. And verse 3 says, without love, and then it goes on to name some others. But here, again, this is saying um, uh, these individuals are without the, the natural affection for the, even their own family members. Uh, we remember uh, in the Bible uh, the story of the first uh, the first murder, uh, the story of Cain and Abel uh, in Genesis chapter 4. Cain, uh, Abel being the two sons of Adam and Eve, uh, that Cain kills his brother uh, Abel. This, this is a lack of natural affection. So here's an example. All right, so, so we, we've seen uh, uh, three expressions or three kinds of love. Eros, which is romantic love. Uh, phileo, uh, which is friendship love, and storge, uh, which is family love. Now, the fourth one, the fourth type of love, um, is, is the one that we really need to understand the most. Uh, this is the one that's referenced most frequently in the New Testament. Uh, this is the, the type of love that God expresses toward us. This is the kind of love that is to continue to be perfected in us. And this love is uh, from the term agape. Agape. You've heard that term, uh, many of you. Now, again, how have we defined uh, this kind of love? This is the love of God that, first of all, it represents His desire for our best interest. That is which, which will benefit us the most, that which is for our highest good, that's what God desires. Uh, a second observation about this kind of love is that it's demonstrated. And so this love is, is God's demonstration of His desire to have our best uh, interest in mind. And that means that he, he acts, he, he does something uh, uh, for our best interest, for our highest good. Um, and again, when, the, when we looked at our uh, text in 1 John chapter 4, uh, verses 7 through 12, let me read it for you once more. Dear friends, uh, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Now this is, uh, uh, this is agape. As a matter of fact, uh, again, if, if my count is correct, I think there's 13 times in which the love appears in this passage. And all 13 of these is a translation, uh, a form of the Greek term agape. Now, let me point out three qualities of this kind of love. Again, we, we've suggested that uh, uh, in, in eros, there are certain qualities in phileo and in storge. All have certain qualities, but, but agape is unique. It's different. What's unique about it? Here are at least three qualities. And again, I think as we study this idea, I want to encourage you to think also of, of how this differs from the other types of love. Number one, uh, this kind of love is a decision. It's not a feeling. It's a decision that we make, uh, and it's a decision that we make to act on behalf of someone else or to act in that person's uh, best interest. Um, and and uh, again, earlier in, in the definition that we've been talking about, we've been talking about uh, uh, desire and 
the idea here is that this desire then, then should lead for us to make a decision then to demonstrate that love, uh, to act in a person's best interest. But the key thing is, this kind of love is a decision. Uh, secondly, this kind of love is unconditional. It's unconditional. It's not based on anything other than it's a part of your character. Why does God love? Uh, he does not love conditionally. He loves because he is love. That's his character. That's what he does. Uh, if you compare that to the other types of love, there's conditions having to do with those other three kinds. Um, when we talk about eros, the, what's the condition there? The condition is I'll love you if I have a certain kind of feeling toward this person. When it comes to uh, phileo, um, uh, I'll love you, you know, if, if I feel kindly affection toward you, if I like you, if we have some common interest. Also, I'll love you if you love me back. That's phileo. Storge, that's based on the family connection. You know, if, if you are a part of my family, then I'm going to love you. If you're not a part of my family, I'm not obligated to love you. Well, in contrast to those conditions that are expressed in the other kinds of love, agape has no conditions. It's totally unconditional. Um, uh, and in particular, uh, in this kind of love, you, you don't expect anything in return. You know, unlike uh, a friendship, you expect it to be mutual. No. With agape, um, uh, you're loving that other person, regardless of what that other person does. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Jesus, and maybe we'll talk about this at some point in the future, Jesus even refers to the fact that, that you are to love your enemies. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I've, I have enemies. I've had people that want to destroy me. And, um, you know, uh, my calling, God says, you, you need to love those individuals, meaning that you still desire the best for them. Now, I've turned them over to God in terms of, of, of God, uh, uh, His justice and, and His compensation of what they have done and continue to do. But, but in terms of my attitude towards those individuals, uh, I love them. I don't wish any harm upon them, no evil. Uh, and that's what, that's what true love really is. So this kind of love is a decision. Uh, it's unconditional. And then thirdly, uh, this kind of love is characterized by sacrificial giving. Sacrificial giving. It gives, number one, but, but the giving goes to the extent that the giver makes a sacrifice. Um, the ultimate expression uh, was by God himself. Again, in 1 John 4 and verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. Uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So, so this kind of love is a sacrificial uh, giving. Uh, just the other day, I was at the gas station uh, getting some gas, um, and uh, there was a couple, uh, well, they're probably in their 30s. Uh, they had just traveled into town, um, and they were uh, coming to visit her father, who's, who's on his deathbed, uh, they had been sitting uh, at the gas station uh, for about an hour, and they were trying to get gas to get to Everett. Well, uh, you know, their car, it was an older car, it was all beat up, and, and you know, with the story that she shared, um, either she was a tremendous actress or uh, she was telling the truth. Well, I believed her story, I believe their story, uh, and I gave them some gas money so they could get to Everett. Well... Well, what did I do there? I was there to get gas for myself. The money that I gave them for gas, I could have used it for gas in my car. That's a, that's a sacrifice. You're giving up something worthwhile, something of value to benefit others, uh, whereas you could have used it yourself. Uh, that's what love is. It, it's, it's giving. Love is sacrificial. So uh, let's, let's summarize here. We've said that... Um, that, that we are to constantly be in the process of, of completing our love, perfecting our love. Uh, God's love is perfect in us. It's complete. There's nothing he can add to it. Our challenge is for us to, to number one, recognize that, appreciate that, worship God for that. But then the love that, that we have experienced from God, we are to express that to others. And we've tried to get a better understanding of this kind of love. We've said that the Greek language uh, has four kinds of love. Eros, which is a romantic, uh, sensual love. Uh, phileo, uh, which is a brotherly love, a kind affection. Uh, storge, which is a family love. And then agape, which is the kind of love with which God loves us. That's the kind of love that we should seek 
to love others. So we'll, we'll continue this next time. Uh, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you, first of all, for uh, your love, uh, that you seek our best interest, you seek our highest good, you desire that, uh, you've decided to, uh, to act on our behalf, you demonstrated that fully, most of all, through sending Jesus Christ to die for our sins, for which we are eternally grateful. We pray that we can uh, grow to appreciate the love that you have given us and that we can grow in our exercise of the love that we have for others. We do this for your glory. Through the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Thanks again so much for joining us today. I, I hope that you learned a few things. You were inspired. You were encouraged in terms of your love, uh, understanding God's love for you and how we are to love others. I want to invite you to join us today at 5 o'clock from 5 to 5.30 online for our live time of prayer and encouragement. Uh, just go to our uh, church uh, uh, home website, which is at holgatecoc.com. Again, that's holgatecoc.com. Uh, go ahead and, and uh, just click on the link there and that'll get you right in. We'll pray for you. We'll encourage you and uh, uh, help, you, help you do that for us. And for those of you who live in our area, we, we are having live worship services. We meet every Sunday at uh, 10 o'clock. We're usually here till about 1115 and we'd like to invite you there. Uh, that's located at 2600 South Holgate Street in Seattle. Uh, we hope you can join us. And if you have questions about our ministry, you want to learn more about the gospel um, or you're interested in being baptized, becoming a Christian, or have a Bible question, uh, please email us at contactus at holgatecoc.com. That's contactus at holgatecoc.com. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Oh.